morning church morning welcome to mark chapter 14 we're getting towards the end this is when we uh, celebrate the, the passover and peter denies christ which is the two things we're going to focus on today and so as we get started i want to read mark chapter 14 verses 22 through 31 for you it says while they were eating he took a loaf of bread and after blessing it he broke it and he gave it to them and said take this is my body then he took a cup and after giving thanks he gave it to them and all of them drank from it and he said to them this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many truly i tell you i will never drink of it again i'll never drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when i drink it in the new kingdom of God and when they had sung to him they went out to the Mount of Olives and Jesus said to them you will all fall away for it is written I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered but after I'm raised up I will go before you to Galilee and Peter said to him though all will fall away I will not he says Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you that this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same thing. So this week, as we look at the story of Peter's denial, I want to explore that a little bit more and for us to learn from that this morning. But I want to go beneath the surface a bit and take a step back from Peter's shortcoming to a wider view and to consider what I believe is to be the more godly look at this section that we've seen about Peter throughout the centuries. Right? I don't want to look at the failure that Peter had by denying Christ. I want to look at Peter's passion that he had but first though a word about passion probably the best known scripture referring to passion is Psalm 69 9 sorry Psalm 69 9 which is a prophecy about what Jesus says he says this passion for your house has consumed me Jesus was passionate about the temple of the Lord and that it would be a place of prayer for everyone but what does it mean to be passionate about something what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus example and being passionate about the church the temple being a house of prayer and how do you get to be passionate about following Jesus as what Peter seemed to be Webster defines passion as a strong emotion that has an overpowering or compelling effect it implies burning intensity it usually suggests eagerness in the pursuit of something so passion is active our passion for something or someone is what motivates us into action and we are called to be passionate followers of Jesus Christ the church which is a bunch of fellow followers of Christ are to be passionate red hot and to be on fire in every aspect for Jesus Revelation chapter 3 verse 16 Jesus said because you are neither hot nor cold I will vomit you out of my mouth Jesus would rather have us be ice cold than lukewarm or just ho-hum kind of Christians it's the lukewarm churches that Jesus wants to vomit out so we want to be passionate people. Now, you know and I know that there's a lot of passion with the people here in this church. We've got lots of passion here. And sometimes our passion, depending on where it comes from, sometimes like Peter, it can get us into a little bit of trouble. Kind of like this UCC pastor. He went wearing his a clerical collar one day while visiting his wife in the hospital 
for a minor surgery. He stopped in to see her and chatted with her for quite some time. Before leaving, he leaned down and gave his wife a very passionate kiss and left the room. The woman in the bed next to his wife stared in disbelief. And after the pastor left, the stunned woman said to her roommate, You know, I've been a faithful member of the United Methodist Church my whole entire life, but my pastor has never even come close to treating me as yours does. Peter was passionate, and his passion motivated his actions. In the scripture we just read a little bit ago, we can discover various actions that Peter's passion motivated him to. And what I hope to show you today is not so much the negative side of Peter's passion, but, but that it was what Jesus might have seen in the passionate disciple of his. That led Jesus to pick to Peter to be the one who would straighten, strengthen his brothers and be the leader of the apostles. And we're going to look at it in just a moment. But first, the first action that we see Peter here in this story is that Peter had only heard the negative. And sometimes we are the same way too, aren't we? But at least Peter heard something. In verses 27 and 28, Jesus said that everyone would desert him. But after he was raised from the dead, that he would go before them to Galilee and would meet them there. Peter only heard a negative part of Jesus' statement. He only heard that everyone was going to desert Jesus. And Peter, he took that personally. Right? He didn't hear the part about Jesus meeting them down the road in Galilee. None of them did. Otherwise, they would have understood that they would see him again. And perhaps, just perhaps, their grief wouldn't have been as deep and their fear wouldn't have been as intense. And we do the same thing today, don't we? Someone says a whole statement to us and we only hear the negative aspect of it, especially if it's something that we perceive as negative about us. And we respond or react to that instead of hearing the whole message. Peter couldn't believe that he would desert his Lord. So he made a statement based on the negative part that he heard. The part that most affected his ego. So the second thing that we see Peter had was he was prideful with his words. But he was well-meaning also. The words that Peter spoke in verses 29 and 31 were full of pride, but Peter meant well. He says in 29, even if everyone else deserts you, I will not. Doesn't that sound rather boastful to you? These other guys, Lord, these other guys that have been following you for the same amount of time as I have, they might break down and desert you and leave you, but you can count on me. I'm Peter. I'm the one you're going to be the rock that you're going to build your church on. I'll be there. I'll even die with you. Peter meant well. I'm sure he didn't really mean to insult his fellow brothers that were probably not too far away from him. His fellow disciples with his words. But they just came pouring out of Peter. Peter was known for talking first and realizing what he said later. But he never thought that he was going to abandon Jesus. And sometimes when we say things, we mean well with our words. We don't mean to insult our brothers or sisters or our parents or our fellow believers. But in our passion, sometimes the words just come out. And we make promises that others may know. And Jesus knows that we can never keep and nine times out of ten, when we speak words that hurt others, no matter how well intentions they may be, we normally speak them out of our own fear and pride. And I'm sure that Peter loved Jesus so much that he didn't want to lose him. And he certainly didn't want to think about deserting his closest friend and being without him. And as soon as Peter gave in to that passion and pride 
in fear. As soon as he made those bold statements, Peter was on a slippery slope, away from keeping the very promises that he had just made. And we see that in the third action that he took, that he followed at a distance. But let's look at it from the other side of, of the coin. At least he followed, right? Verse 54 says that Peter followed Jesus at a distance and went right into the high priest's courtyard. Peter followed. Yes, followed at a distance, but still he followed. Peter was a fisherman, right? Peter wasn't accustomed to this kind of lifestyle or political arena of the high priest. And yet, here he is. And one transition says he even went into the courtyard. This was the high priest's home. And here's this fisherman, dressed like a fisherman, walks and talks like a fisherman, and he goes right into the courtyard of the cultural elite of the day. And the rest of the verse 54 says, There he sat with the guards, warming himself by the fire. There he was, and he's sitting with the guards, the guards who end up arresting Jesus. As we look at the fourth thing, Peter, Peter was present with those enemies. But at least he was present. Peter is now getting himself deeper and deeper. After his bold statements, his false but well-meaning promises, his limited hearing, he now finds himself hanging out with the wrong crowd. He's warming his hands with the enemy by the fire. And folks, if we're not careful, if we don't listen to the whole message that Jesus has for us, if we don't let Jesus rule our lives with passion and allow Jesus to redeem our pride and sinful nature, we will be sitting right there where Peter was. We'll be warming our hands. We'll be getting our pleasure and satisfaction. We'll be having our needs met right there in the fire of the enemy. And pretty soon, a little servant girl is going to come along and say, you are one of those people that were with that Jesus from Nazarene. As it says in verse 67, and we're going to say, I don't know what you're talking about. Next, Peter spoke against the Lord. But at least he spoke. Peter said words that denied his Lord, but he did speak. In just a few short hours, Peter's words went from one end of the scale, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, to the other end of the scale where he goes, I don't even know who that guy is. Right? I would rather die than abandon Jesus. And then girl says, you're with that Jesus from Nazareth. And he goes, who? Who are you talking about? And we don't know for sure, but I think it's pretty safe to say that this was the deepest, darkest hour of Peter's ministry, of his relationship with Jesus, whom he loved so much, even more than when he got out of the boat and sank because he took his eyes off Jesus. Peter had denied Jesus. And as we look at number six, he denied his identity, but his identity remained. From the deepest, darkest part of this story, we see one of the most beautiful evidences of what it means to be a follower of Christ. I think there is a significant analogy here. In verse 70 of Mark's account, the men standing around there say that surely Peter must have been with Jesus because he's a Galilean. In Matthew's gospel, it says, surely you must be one of them for your accent gives you away. Even when Peter denied who he was, there was something about him that told the other people that he was really with Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I count on that every single day of my life. And I find such comfort and encouragement from this part of the story. Right? Peter had been with Jesus for three years now. He was following Jesus 
walking with Jesus, talking with Jesus, and seeing all the stuff that Jesus had done. Right? And I'm so thankful, and I hope that I have followed Jesus the right way throughout my whole entire life. I've committed myself passionately enough to him, and he has put his mark deeply on my life that even when I mess up, and I know I mess up because I'm human, right? But I know that Jesus is right there walking with me the whole time. Oh, and that we follow closely enough that Jesus has been allowed to mark us with his stamp and his redemption and his sanctification. That we even, when we mess up, others still look at us and have no questions that we belong to Jesus. Peter may have denied knowing Jesus, but Jesus never changes. And that happens to us even today. When our passion sometimes gets a little misdirected or maybe pride creeps in just a little bit. Because next we see that Peter believed in himself. And you know what? Christ believed in Peter too. Christ believes in us even today. And when Peter made his bold statements, he was believing in himself. But did you catch the way it went earlier in the scripture? It said, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. There's that old I that gets us in so much trouble now, doesn't it? I can do anything. Remember when Pilate said to Jesus in his passion, don't you know that I have the power to release you or crucify you? And what did Jesus say? You would have no power over me at all unless it was given to you from above. Pilate thought all the power was his. He said, don't you know I? Peter did the same thing. He said, even if they abandon you, I never will. That one letter, I, gets us in a lot of trouble, doesn't it? Next, Peter remembered Jesus' words and repented. Peter remembered Jesus' word, and we're told he broke down and wept bitterly after the rooster crowed. We talked a little bit about Peter being broken and repentant. It's important to understand this verse accurately. Verse 72 of Mark 14. Here's Jesus' words, and they must have flashed in Peter's mind after all this. See, it was not the rooster crowing that led Peter to repentance. It was Jesus' words. Temporal things don't lead to repentance. Only the word of God leads us to a place of repentance. That's why the preaching of the word and the understanding of scripture is so important, especially in this day and age. Which leads into number nine. Satan sifted Peter, but Jesus strengthened him. You can find reference to this in Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. Two of the most beautiful verses in all the scripture says this. Simon, Simon. Now, Jesus referred to him as Simon when he was doing the wrong thing. He referred to him as Peter when he was doing the right thing. So here, he doesn't just say Simon. He says Simon, Simon. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And you notice Satan has to ask permission to do that. Satan has to ask permission to sift us like wheat also. But Jesus says, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, it will strengthen your brothers. Do you notice that Jesus says, so when you have repented, and turn to me again. Jesus knows Peter's love for him and how that's going to turn around. You could do a whole sermon just on that one verse because Satan has to get permission. 
Jesus prayed for Peter. Jesus prays for us today as well. When we repent, Jesus gives us the power and the strength to help others. That just makes you have to put a smile on your face and be joyful. Well, that's the story. What happened to Peter? He went from eating at the table at the Last Supper to following Jesus at a distance. He went from sitting in the courtyard to standing in the entryway. He went from weeping bitterly to witnessing boldly. I won't take the time this morning to go into each one of these, but you can look up the references and let the Holy Spirit speak to you and guide you as you do that. What is the application for us? What we see in this wonderful story of Peter, I think that first of all, that we see that God uses passionate people. Even before Peter sifting, even while Jesus knew Peter would deny him, he had a work for Peter to do. He had a job for Peter. And Jesus has a job for each one of us. We are all called to be ministers of this world. And we do so according to God's purposes. Our passion is our identity with Christ. Philippians 4.13 says that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Without him we can't do anything, but with him nothing is impossible. Our identity is Christ who lives in each one of us. Galatians 2.20 says this, My old self has been crucified with Christ. Now here it is. It is no longer here that I, we talked about, it is no longer I, right? That I word gets us in a lot of trouble. It's Christ. We point ourselves to Christ and others to Christ, right? Because Christ loves us so much. He wants us to get rid of that sinful and prideful person. And once Peter got rid of the I in his life, he was able to be a bold witness for Christ. In fact, all the other times we see Peter in Scripture, and especially in the letters that he wrote to the provinces, we see him saying things like, think clearly and exercise self-control. That's quite a thing for a passion of Peter, who we just saw. But he says the trials makes us partners with Christ, so that we can have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed. And in 1 Peter 4.19, he tells us to keep on doing what is right. Trust your lives to Christ, because he will never fail you, Peter says. I think that Peter learned that Jesus never fails when he got the message from the women on Easter Sunday morning. He said, go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. And so we come full circle to where we started this morning, right? Before Jesus died, when he told his disciples that they would all desert him. But after he was raised from the dead, that he would go before them and meet them in Galilee. And on Easter morning, over 2,000 years ago, the message was given from the angel to the women to go tell the disciples, including Peter, who had just denied Jesus three times, that indeed he was waiting for them in Galilee. But once we are sifted, we will be stronger in the long run. Peter was sifted, and he writes these words in 1 Peter 5.10. He says, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore you and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. And so I submit to you this morning that Satan has asked to sift all of us like wheat. But Jesus is saying to us this morning, I have prayed for you 
Walters Gate United Methodist Church, that your faith may not fail and you will turn back. Strengthen your brothers and your sisters. And I have also prayed for you, insert your name here individually, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your fellow believers. What words of encouragement from Jesus that even though we fail and we turn our backs on Jesus, Jesus never turns his back on us and is welcoming us with open arms after we have sinned and fallen short and come begging for repentance. Let us pray this morning. Brother Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy and kindness and, and your glory, Jesus. And we, we thank you for the story of Peter because that's all of us. We have all denied you multiple times and you're always there to pick us up and forgive us each time. We thank you for your love and encouragement and we love that we can look at things from different perspectives and see a different point of view. Instead of looking at things from a negative point of view, it's so wonderful when we look at it from a positive point of view, from your eyes, Jesus. And we just thank you for all your love. We thank you for loving us. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being with us this morning. And we'll see you next week.